So what are we going to talk about today? We are going to talk about some very tiny things. Uh, it occurred to me uh, after looking at a couple of emails that Anne sent me that maybe I didn't know as much as I should about various types of hand stitching needles or pins. So we did a little research and we thought, you know, we could maybe tell our nice Facebook friends about the various types of needles because I don't know, for so many years it was like, oh, here's one, I'll try this and, you know, try and put it through the fabric and it doesn't work and it kind of sticks and everything. So if you do any amount of hand stitching, whether it's just putting on your binding or you're really into embroidery and needlework and that sort of thing, you deserve some really, really good needles. So I've got kind of a selection out here. I've pulled out a whole variety of needles just off the floor and I thought, oh, this is interesting. They're all different sizes. How do I know which one to choose? So in my research, I discovered there's basically three parts to a needle. There's the eye, we know this. Then there's the shaft and there's the point. And some of those things can vary from needle to needle. So just really, really briefly, this guy here. Uh, I want to go back to there. There's your basic sharps, they're called. Let's see if we got that in focus a little bit. Anyway, now your sharps have a fairly small eye. They're used for general sewing. And of course, they come in different sizes. I chose kind of a mid-range. This is a number 10. So you're not going to get a really big piece of thread through the eye of that needle. So general purpose, stitching down your bindings, whatever feels comfortable, you're using one strand of basic sewing thread. After that, and this is our other brand of needles, these are the John James, and these are the Clovers. You'll find people do have kind of preferences as to which brand of needles they use. They all should work pretty much the same as long as they're fresh and new. So these are embroidery needles. So if you like to do embroidery, and the main difference between these and your sharps is the size of the eye. You can't see it on screen, but trust me, the eye on this embroidery needle has got to be at least three times as long this way as on the sharps. So you can get that uh, DMC, that embroidery floss through the eye of that needle whereas you wouldn't be able to get it through a standard sharp. The eye of the needle size is important in two ways. It's important because you got to get the thread through it so you want an eye that's big enough to accommodate the thread but it is also what is going to push the fibers of your fabric apart and let that thread go through. So personally, I like to use the smallest possible needle I can for whatever I'm doing. But I find sometimes I've gone too small. I can get the thread through and I push it. And by the time the thread goes through, the, gets to the fabric, it won't go through. It's going to pull you and you're tugging. That's not good. I need a needle then with a little bit bigger eye on it. That's going to make a little bit bigger space. And pull that thread through nicely without tearing into the fabric. So those are sharps and embroidery needles. Now here's another different size. This is a multi-pack of embroidery needles here. Let's, let's switch you over to this guy. There's a multi-size pack of embroidery needles. So you can get a span and this one runs between three to nine. So if you're doing some embroidery and some of it's single thread, some of it's double thread, maybe a mixed package like that is what you're going to be looking for. So then now as you go up in thread size, maybe you don't want to do embroidery so much as you want to do tapestry. So tapestry work has, is usually done on a larger canvas, has some spaces in it. And what you don't want to do with tapestry is split those. You want a needle that's going to 
go between the threads of your canvas. So a tapestry needle, besides having a much bigger eye, because very often you're working with wool, is going to have a duller point. So still pointy, but definitely not super duper sharp on this guy. So there's your tapestry needle. So have a look at that. And this one's called a chenille needle. And you go, boy, they look pretty much the same. They do in some ways. The eye of the needle, pretty much the same. But your tapestry needle is going to have a blunt point, And your chenille needle is going to have a sharp point. Sharp and pointy. So a chenille needle has a large eye, a sharp point. And you might want to use that if you're getting into things like ribbon embroidery. Well, you need to pierce through the fabric, but you're still pulling that width of ribbon through with that. So that's your chenille needle. Um, our chenille needles, uh, Ursula is asking a question. Are chenille needles good for hand tying quilts with number eight pearl cotton? I think that would be an ideal needle. I, now, the ones that I have out here are an 18 chenille needle, Ursula. You might want to get something a little smaller than that if you find you're having difficulty getting that through your fabric. But because it's got the sharp point, it should go through fairly nicely. So yeah, that's a, that's a really good use for that one. Gold eye applique needles, these guys. And they ju are just a specialty version of a sharp. We have, what does it say? fine long needle and you want the length in your needle if you're doing applique needle turn because you want to have enough needle to tuck the edge of that fabric under maybe one day we'll do a little demo on needle turn applique it's lots and lots of fun and then what they call quilting needles so how come quilting needles are so short your standard quilting needle for hand quilting is very short but it and has a small round eye because we're just using a single strand of thread. In fact, I've been doing some hand quilting with the 80 weight deco bob. It's lovely. And then you just stack your stitches onto the needle and pull it through. Doesn't make a very large hole in your quilt. Slides through the multiple layers that we have. Um, easily because it's not very fat so those are your basic needles and there's probably I didn't find a printed brochure in the store on them there's lots of information online always and the packages are wonderful resources when you're in doubt and you're looking at which one do I choose have a look at the back it'll tell you what what that particular needle is good for so besides that, of course, you've got specialty needles. These are ones here, these ones here, look at those. Long, very, very fine, and very small eye on those ones. And those are beading needles. So if you like to put some beading, especially the fine seed beads onto things, you're going to need a needle that the bead will slide all the way along and pop off easily. Beading needles, how about these guys? These are taken from the old sailmaker's needles, or also called upholstery needles. These are curved quilting needles, that's what this says here. But they are also useful if you have to stitch something um, like a slip cover and you're actually stitching it onto a firm surface. You want something that can dip in and curve back out again. So curved needles, and we didn't I have any doll needles. Look at these guys. Those are wicked, eh? Look at those. Those are your upholstery needles. So long enough and heavy duty enough to put that button back on that cushion on your sofa. You know, the one the dog chewed off and you've managed to recover it and you get that heavy, heavy thread. But you want something that's going to be able to pierce all the way through that cushion. So upholstery needles. That should keep you sewn together fairly well. Now, the, the other fun thing that I found. Pins. 
nice and sharp. Oh, there's there's so many pins. I mean, it's it's kind of like the hardware store for quilters, isn't it? There we are. Line those guys up. So, are you still the type of person who's working with? Oh, can't see those. Move that up. With those guys, you know, the ones that that hurt your fingers when you try and pull them out. And uh, very early on in my sewing life. Uh, I'll tell you a little story about this type of pin. I was in the process of moving, had a project that I'd gotten started. I think I was making placemats or something. Put the um, pins in, got things packed away, traveled halfway across the country. I moved from Calgary to Kingston, Ontario. Stuff sat in boxes, finally got things settled. By the time I pulled my project out to work on it, Everywhere where the pin had touched the fabric was a little rust spot. So just that experience taught me to always make sure I buy good quality pins. Always make sure you buy stainless steel pins, things that are not going to rust, especially if you're in any sort of humidity. That being said, what kind of pins are you going to use? Well, we've got a variety set out here. There's your basic patchwork pins. I think we're all familiar with these. Medium length, good, nice, round knob on the top to grab them. These ones are uh, the extra fine because pin shafts come in different thicknesses. When you're quilting, you want to try and get as fine a pin as possible. They might not last as long. You might end up with something like this. But then, then you know it's time to replace your pins. So basic patchwork pins, we're all familiar with those. Quilting pins. These are longer shafted. This one says heat resistant glass head suitable for ironing. So if you're pinning things down and you're going to iron it before you you stitch it you've got that glass head you don't have to worry about it melting and then flower head pins these are nice because when you put that pin into your fabric and you want to use your cutting ruler to make a secondary cut in your fabric this has is not going to interfere with your ruler laying flat. So I think we've all seen those. Something we maybe haven't seen before though are these guys. I wonder if I can get this out of the package. Pop this out. Oh, there's one right there. These are a flathead pin, but you can see they have a number on them. So this is a whole set of numbered pins when you're doing a lot of piecing, you're stacking up your, your pieces ready to go. Put a pin in with the number of the row and you're not going to get things mixed up. So I think those are a really good invention. Much better than the closed pins with the uh, numbers written on them that I used to use. And then a couple more little specialty things. I cannot get that out of the package. I'm going to squeeze it down real good. Hopefully you can see it. Applique pins. Look at this. Those are, and I've used these guys, they are very, very short. They're only about, well, if you're looking at my bent pin here, they're about as long as from the head to the bend in that pin. And those are ideal for applique because they're not going to catch when you stitch either with by machine or especially by hand. So you don't want to be tangling that thread um, <clears throat> around your pins as you sew and then the pin gets pulled out. And These are great little things. Yes, Ursula, actually the uh, numbered pins are in stock right now. Um, you can always give the girls up at the front a quick phone call and they'll set it aside for you until you're able to come in and get it. Or if you're out of town, um, we can always send it to you. 
One more thing I wanted to show you, and I was hoping I could get this package open because I just think they are so, so cool. Um, let's, let's see. Let's see if I can find a little pair of scissors. And I'm just going to cut open the bottom of this. Hey, if I end up having to buy a package of pins, it's not going to be the worst thing in the world. Because I kind of think these are really, really fun. There we go. These are called fork pins. And they're a little too small for your hot dogs. But I can see where something like this is going to be a distinct advantage. So if you look at that guy, almost looks like the old-fashioned uh, hat pins or... or um, People just stick them in your hair. Bobby pins. Not quite bobby pins. Forget what they were called. So they're two-pronged pins. And the top of them here has a bit of a curve to it. So if you are piecing, you have your fabric like this. Especially if you're trying to match seams. And I like to press my seams open. Because I like the way it lays flatter. So... It's pretty good lining up those seams, but then you got your pin and do you go this way? Do you go that way? Do you just pin one side and then you go to sew across it and of course the other half flips over? With the fork pins, you can come in one side on either side of that seam and pin it together that way. And that's gonna lay nice and flat as you come along and stitch, as usual, you're going to pull your pin out when you get there. But you don't have to worry about that underneath seam flipping up before you get to it. So, I just think those are the coolest thing. So, and we do cut, they come in two different size packages of... Uh, of fork pins. I think the one that I opened is the 70 piece because they are fairly delicate. Okay, they could they could drop on the floor and disappear. Yeah. Be careful with them. So lots of different pins for your quilting needs. Lots of different ways of using the pins, using the needles, and like anything we do, um, anything in quilting or other parts of our life, we can always make our life easier if we have the right tool for the job. Just remember to stay calm, stay safe, be kind to everyone out there, and I will see you maybe Thursday or maybe next week. I'm not sure who's doing Thursday right now. Take care, and we'll talk to you later.